Today's session is sling inspections, and we're going to cover slings and hardware. Just to get it started, there are three different types of inspections. Uh, one is your initial inspection, which is prior to your initial use, when you first purchase the product, does it meet the requirements you, you, you wanted for when you ordered it? Is it correct? Uh, the right length, the right size, uh, the right hardware you're looking for. Um, this all has to be, should be inspected by somebody who's knowledgeable. The next one we're going to skip over because that's one of the most important ones. But the third one is the periodic inspection. Uh, these are normally annual inspections. Um, it, and they depend on severity of service. So if you have slings you're using day in and day out um, and they need to be looked at more often, we have had customers who use uh, slings for heavy lifts and inspect them on a monthly basis. They have somebody who has been trained in their facility will go through to a monthly inspection. Your frequent inspection is your each day or shift before the sling is used. This is the one where everybody seems to fall down. They say they do it. Oh yeah, we look at them a little bit, but the, this is the, the inspection is the most critical. And if, if you're doing your job correctly on the frequent inspection, when somebody comes in and does that periodic inspection, they should find some, nothing wrong. Um, there should no be, not be a big purchase order that has to be cut to replace all the slings that were condemned. They should be, kept, be caught throughout the year during that frequent inspection. Now OSHA says a frequent inspection is, is defined as each day or prior to each shift. So if you're running three shifts, that would be three times a day. Now on a scale of one to 10, OSHA basically is a five on, on uh, being a very hard to meet. What we say when it comes to frequent inspection, it's not prior to each shift, it's prior to each lift. You need to be looking at this stuff because through the accident investigations that I have done, I have found more damage done on a previous lift than sometime down the road. You know, the, you have the damage done on the previous lift, then it fails. So we have to catch these things between lifts, not once a shift. When it comes to these types of inspections, your initial re, uh, inspection is not required to be written down. It does not have to be recorded. Your frequent inspection does not have to be recorded, but your periodic inspection does. OSHA can actually ask for a copy of this inspection, and if you cannot produce it, they can actually cite you for not having it. Um, normally, in the, in the 43 years that I've been in this business, I have had three or four people have OSHA come in and ask for it. So it doesn't happen very often because most times the OSHA compliance officers don't realize that it, that, that is in there. Uh, they have other areas of expertise, but if you have an accident, guess what? They're going to ask for it, and if you can't produce it, that is a violation. On the pocket guides, we have information here. This is, this is what we, I refer to as your cheat sheet. This is why these things, these little pocket guides are really handy. Um, they, they give you all the information you're looking for. Uh, when it comes to wire rope slings, for example, uh, excessive broken wires uh, for strand laid and single leg grounds, it gives you the, the, the criteria, how many you can have, um, scrapey, bro, uh, damage resulting from bro rope structure. We'll talk about all these, but they, it goes through all this information. Start off with wire rope. You're looking for any kind of broken wires. They do say that you can have 10, 10 randomly broken wires in one rope lay or five broken wires in one strand in one rope lay. One rope lay is the distance it takes one strand to make a complete revolution around the course. So this is a six strand of cable. So it's one, two, three, four, five, six. In that distance, you can have 10 broken wires, six in this strand, two in this strand, and two in this strand. Once you get to 10, it's out of service. Or if this one had six, that alone would condemn it because you have five broken, more than five broken wires in that one strand. So broken wires are one of the criteria they use, but we don't normally have broken wires on slings. We have broken wires on running ropes for crane ropes, stuff like that. I only have one customer that really wears slings out and breaks wires on a regular basis in, in the slings. Um, so if you find a one broken wire in a sling, 
usually I can find some other reason to condemn it and take it out of service. So if you find one, just get rid of it. Next one is what gets into loss of metallic area and, and, and metal loss. And they are saying one third of the diameter of an individual wire. Now, <laughs> good luck measuring that. Um, so basically, if you see the wire rope, it looks like it's been dragged around and it has flat spots on it, just take it out of service. If you've, if you've dragged it around enough to where you're wearing the wire rope to where there's flat spots, that's usually gonna be enough to where you're gonna end up with this piece of wire rope being condemned anyway. Um, and you're, it's beyond its useful life. Any kind of kinks, twists in the strands has to be taken out of service. We're, we're looking for those distortions in the strands. <clears throat> a piece of wire rope um, has to have all those strands and all the wires in proper alignment for them to adjust and work. And so if there's, they're out of position, it has to be taken out. Look for displaced strand. If a strand is significantly dislocated fl or flattened and crushed, that's where the wire rope is going to be locked off in, in what we call a dog leg. And is, if, there, if, if you have a dog leg but everything is in position, I wouldn't necessarily take it out of service. But in this case, it... Uh, in this case, it, it would be uh, um, fine if all the strands are in position. Deformed eyes, flat, severe flattening and crushing. Um, we have found uh, through some of our own testing that, that while they say that you have to take them out of service, you know, one small high strand or something like that isn't necessarily enough. But if you have flattened and crushed and distorted, distorted eyes, um, take it out of service. We're trying you, what you should do is look at how you're using them, make sure that those eyes are going over large enough pieces so that they don't flatten and crush and, and go out. Wire rope slings can be used at various temperatures. Um, the first one is fiber core slings. <clears throat> we don't see those anymore, or if we do, it's very rarely maybe in a hand splice sling, but most of our wire rope nowadays is gonna be a steel cord wire rope and you're good for temperatures up to 400 degrees <clears throat> and down to minus 60 without any, any loss. We do have to be careful around chemicals with, with uh, wire rope slings. We have to make sure that uh, we don't have any acids or caustics, vapors and fumes that will corrode uh, the wire rope. When it comes to repairing wire rope slings, uh, we often get asked, well, can, can, I, can, I, can we tag, re-tag them? What we do is we say, as part of a sling inspection, the first thing we always look for is a tag. If that tag is missing, it immediately has failed. Um, the tag has to be in position. If the tag is lost, can, can, we as, can you re-tag it or can we re-tag it? We consider that a repair, and we will re-tag the sling in accordance with the law, uh, but we will do a visual inspection and then we will re-tag it and then load test it and certify it. <clears throat> I have a question, how long would it, would, could lasting in high or low temperature during storage? Once the sling has met those higher or lower high temperatures, um, especially with high temperatures, you've changed the, the, the metallurgy of the steel and it has to be taken out of service. Low temperature normally, once it comes back up to temperature, it's not so bad, but with high temperatures, definitely it's, it's an issue. Wire rope used in the sling shall not be repaired. Repair shall be restricted to the end attachments or fittings. If the wire rope in a sling is damaged, then what we can do is we can take and in a lot of cases, reuse the fittings. So if you have a sling that the, uh, let's say a two-leg or three-legged bridle, where the bodies of the slings have been damaged, but the hardware is in good shape, normally it becomes economically feasible to, to either bring the sling down to us and we'll cut the hardware out and we can re-splice new wire rope to it. But there are some economic parameters here. Normally it's, we, we look at anything above about a three-ton capacity piece of hardware. Anything below that, it's just not economically feasible to do it. So 
kind of look at that yourself or bring stuff in and we'll take a look at it. We'll tell you whether it's going to be economically feasible. So with repaired slings, they are all, every single one of them is load tested and certified. So we issue a proof test certificate for it. Here we have some good examples. You can take a look at these really quick. You know, some of them, they're not gonna be so obvious. Like if you, if just looking at number one, what do you see? Um, well, first of all, improper storage. These, uh, you know, a lot, of, a lot of people have toolboxes. Do you leave your tools laying around? Well, a sling is a tool. It should be taken care of properly, stored properly, hang it up, coil them up and hang them up so that they're not getting driven over, they're not laying in the dirt and mud, um, and so they don't get damaged. So number two has dog legs present, any kind of bends that just have displaced strands, bending over sharp corners as part of, uh, other seminars, we talk about sharp corners and what we, we would what would constitute a sharp corner, and uh, but we're not going to get into that today. But a sharp corner would put a permanent set or crushing of the strands and cause that deformation. <clears throat> oh, sorry about that. Wire number three, severe deformation. That's a straight up kink where the wire rope is formed in a loop, and then they pull that, that loop out without letting it un unlay or untwist or take that twist out of it. That is significant permanent deformation, and that's where, where the sling would fail. Here we have broken strands. Um, I've seen this before on braided wire rope slings where entire strands were broken. Um, severe uh, uh, overload uh, would, would cause this or kinking. I have a question. When storing slings, if stored in water, can the cause the sling to rot? And at what point do we take the, the, the sling out of service? On fiber core ropes, definitely they will rot. On other wire ropes, they will corrode, they will rust. And when you have severe rust, or we call rust, not just surface rust, but pitting, you've now lost metallic area, which gets you into that third, one third of a wire loss. So if you have wire, wire rope where it has sit in the, the water long enough to where you have rust, it's probably no good. So, Historically, years and years ago, people would store their larger wire rope slings on pallets in upstate New York. Um, they get snowed on uh, out in the yard, and then come, come springtime, they want to dig them out and try to use them, and then they wonder why we condemn them. Well, once you have that severe corrosion and rust, it's out of service. Number five shows you severe corrosion, exposure to salt water, where you have that pitting. Number six shows severe broken wires, abusive use, and I know, again, a grounds for removal service. Here we have a few more to kind of take a look at. A lot of these are very severe cases. Some of them are so significant. Like number seven kind of looks like some dog legs, but it does have damage but also the latch kits are not functioning. Now, if everybody has their chat up, or actually can raise your hand to this, if the answer to this is my que this question is yes, I want you to raise your hand. Does OSHA or ASMA require you to have latch kits on your slings? How many say yes? All right, somebody just answered and then took it. Okay, now they're back. Okay, I've got 10 of you who said yes. And to be honest with you, out of 40, 41 of you in the class, the answer is no. Ocean and ASME do not say you have to have a latch kit on your sling hooks. Now, if, why would you think that OSHA should, should have one? Well, a lot of people will say because there's a hole in the hook and you would be correct. The manufacturers now, we have Crosby and Columbus McKinnon, are now will not sell us as a distributor hooks without latch kits on them. So therefore, they don't want you using slings without hook uh, latch kits. 
So therefore, you can't. Um, under OSHA, 1910, 19, or the General Duty Clause 5A1, I'm sorry about that, General Duty Clause 5A1 said, you as an employer are required to provide a safe place to work and follow the OSHA regulations and industry practices. And the industry practice today is we put latch kits on all hooks. Now, somebody has asked the question, isn't it dependent on the hook type? Yes, there are specialty hooks like shakeout hooks or pelican hooks for sorting steel that are, will, will not accept a latch. And there's also foundry hooks, but those are specialty hooks. Those are specific for specific applications. They're not a general purpose or general use hook. So if you're using a sorting hook, that is basically for stuff low to the ground, nothing at heights, the way OSHA identifies it. <clears throat> Number eight shows a shackle and a wire rope eye with a bent pin, and it's corroded and rusty, which means nobody's been doing their proper inspection on this at all. Wire rope slings to form eyes, not, uh, and a knot between the clip on this one. As far as the manufacturers of clips, they don't want you making slings with wire rope clips anymore. They don't even want you using U-bolt clips for making handrails. Crosby has now come out and said they want J-bolts, or what they call a fist grip, to be used as a uh, for handrails. Okay, I have a question on latch kit. Is it acceptable to replace safety latch itself if the hook seems fine and safe? Yeah, you can replace the latch kits. It's not a problem at all. And you don't have to follow any other, do anything else with it. That's not an, a load bearing member of the latch kit is not. So therefore you can go ahead and replace them. Um, if you get tired of replacing latch kits, you can purchase slings with what they call a Sherlock or a positive locking latch hook where the latch is an integral part of the hook. And that's while initially a little more expensive, they are uh, they do last a lot better and, and uh, elim eliminate that little expense you keep on getting hit with every every time you do something. Number ten. This one's not quite so obvious, but you you look up in here. Notice the the shackle. The pin is not all the way indexed. That Shoulders should be seated against the bow of the shack of the shackle, and so it has to be tight. The, the, everybody likes to take and say, "Okay, you screw the pin in, you back it off a quarter turn. That way, it doesn't jam up on you." Well, you know, all safety rules are written in blood. So what happens is people have done that, and we've had shackle pins come out and fail. Here we have wire rope slings with clips. We don't like that, and uh, sockets put out installed incorrectly. With chain slings, chain slings can get long for two different reasons. If you have a two-legged bridle, the best way to find out is to hang them. If one's a little longer than the other, that shows we have a problem. Count the number of links in each leg. If they both have the same number of links, then one leg is stretched. You cannot have a sling get longer from stretch. You can't have a sling get longer from wear. Just understand that all chain slings have to have tags on them, and that tag should indicate what the sling was built and what the length was at that time, and the measurements from the bearing point of the ring to the bearing point of the hook. If it's longer than that, now we have to say, okay, was it stretch or is it wear? And you may not want to make that distinction. You may just want to say, okay, we're going to have somebody else look at this. So you pull it out of service, you send it down to us, we'll take a look and see if we have wear or stretch. With wear, you're not allowed to, to exceed 10%, and there are specific charts by manufacturer to show what the uh, actual dimensions should be, and if you exceed that dimension, then it's out of service. Any bent links, you have one bent link, that sling is done. Nicks and gouges, and nicks and gouges, while you can blend them out, I would not advise doing it yourself, leave it to some professionals to do, but if you have a nick or a gouge, we can blend it out. And if we exceed that 10%, then the sling is no good. But cracks, that's a no-no. We will not allow any kind of cracks. Slings do have a temperature range, anywhere from 400 to minus 40. 
and they actually have higher temperatures than that, but at anything above 400 degrees, there's normally gonna be a reduction in the sling capacity, a permanent reduction. You can usually see where we have no heat damage, chain looks fine, a little gray color. Then when you get high heat damage, I've actually had slings that have been in bright blue and turquoise colors when they cool down. Here we have weld splatter. With weld splatter, that is a pinpoint high temperature area, definitely exceeding that 400 degrees, and therefore it's out of service. Any kind of corrosion, pitting, or severe overload where it has broken, it's out of service. With synthetic web slings, again, card number four in these pocket guides, we'll list out what you're looking for. We're looking for any kind of face cuts. They have found that a 10% cut in the edge or the face of a sling can cost you up to 40% of the breaking strength. So you, while you may think the sling is just fine, um, take a little closer look at it because the, uh, depending on how the webbing was made makes a difference on how much strength you, or you have lost or what we call reserve strength is left in that sling. You're looking for those red marker yarns, but don't use that as the only method. Just because you don't see red does not mean the sling is okay. If you do see red, definitely that sling is no good, but I usually go by the rule, if it's ugly, it's out. If, it, if I don't like the way it looks, I'm taking it out of service. They're not that expensive, and as I'll indicate at the very end, nylon slings are on sale this month. Here we have cuts, web ed uh, edge cuts punctures, abrasion. This could be from picking up on concrete and having the sling slide across the edge. That's grounds for removal from service. Knots, you're not allowed to tie synthetic slings or any kind of sling in a knot in any way, shape or form. And again, tags, if the tag is missing, it has to be there. Temperature range. 194 degrees down to minus 40. So we could have heat damage. With nylon and polyester slings, you do have to really watch out for chemically active environments. With nylon, you have to really watch out for acids. And with polyester slings, you have to watch out for caustics. Then they will cause chemical damage and cause premature failure of the sling. <clears throat> What happens with some chemical damage, the sling will become somewhat stiff and brittle, especially with ultraviolet. Um, just having the sling sit out in the sun over for long periods of time will cause degradation of the sling. When it comes to, uh, some slings have hardware, so we have hardware on slings. All hardware, whether it, uh, all hardware has to be marked with at least the size and definitely the manufacturer's information. They are designed for certain design factors based on their capacity. Uh, anything from up to 150 tons is a five to one. Shackles over 150 have a four to one. You get into bolt, eye bolts and eye nuts, full hoist rings, links, they're all five to one. And then minimum on crane blocks and stuff like that are four to one design factor. We're gonna skip that one. But we're, these are the types of hardware we're talking about and also goes for hooks. And what we're, again, getting into the inspection, we have the same inspection criteria, but we're really looking for is making sure that you can read the identification on, this, on the hardware. The name or trademark of the manufacturer shall be forged or cast or die stamped. The, the, the manufacturer must provide this information. You can't just stamp something on it yourself. You have to maintain that inf information, so you gotta protect it so it doesn't get uh, ground or rubbed off. Once it's gone, it's gone, the, the, the piece of hardware is out of service. Shackles have to have the red low capacity, uh, the size on the bow or the grade of the material with uh, links, rings, turnbuckles. They'll have a grade or the size or rated load, but mostly we will not see rated loads on turnbuckles and eye bolts. Hoist rings will have rate of load and a torque value for the bolts. Wire rope clips will have the manufacturer name and the size and wedge socks we don't normally get into except for some of you guys who are doing deal with cranes. We gotta store it to protect it from damage. 
We do have temperature ranges. Normally it's between 400 and minus 40 degrees. If you get below 40 degrees or if you below zero, we do have um, certain rigging criteria, lift at a very slow, steady rate, uh, increased lubrication schedules on, on some blocks and stuff, removal of all nicks and gouges because those kinds of things will cause problems. Anything below 40, the rules, all the rules change and there are actually hardware made that are made for these lower temperatures. So, rigging hardware, adjustable hardware, such as turnbuckles, eye bolts, eye nuts, comp and compression hardware. We're looking for these inspections to be done. There are no written records to be required for hardware unless it's part of a piece of equipment that requires a written record. For example, a lifting beam or spreader bar, or it's attached to a sling. A hook on a sling now becomes part of that sling and that requires a written report be done on it. We're looking for wear. Again, that 10% rule. If you can see a groove being worn in the sling or, or into that piece of hardware, it's time for taking it out of service. Any deformation, what they call classify as significant deformation. If you can see it, it's significant. Or a change in its shape, like a hook that's twisted sideways, it's out of service. Making sure you don't have any visible bend or twist out of plane. They say they get into the hook latch opening. On, on newer hooks, there's a mark here, this forge mark here, and here it's what they call a quick check. You can actually measure across those two spots and it will actually, should read between on the full inch or half inch increment. If it's reading other than those increments, then it's out of service. You're looking for cracks sharp nicks, gouges. We do not substitute bolts and shackles. We do not weld on any of this hardware, any hooks, turnbuckles, um, shackles. We don't, do not weld on any of this stuff. You're looking for missing latches when required. And I, I, and I would argue that all latch kits, if there's a place for a latch kit, there should be one there and you can be cited for not having it. Damage latches at present. If they, the latch is there, it has to work. With bearings on swivels and stuff, they should all be rotate freely. Looking for any missing nuts, bolts, cotter pins, snap rings, or the fasteners or retaining devices. Any malfunction or missing locking devices is cause removal from service. Heat damage, which means exposure above 400 degrees, any weld splatters, arc strikes, exposure to excessive tension will damage the heat treatment. These are all go through a special process. These are not just forged items that just get thrown out in, in the service. They go through other processes. So we have these temperature ranges. If you do use cable clamps, you have to make sure they're installed correctly. We do not want, want to see these malleable pot metal cable clamps out on job sites. These are designed back in the early 1900s, probably even before that. They're castings. They're made for iron ropes, not modern day wire ropes. So you should be using drop forged U-bolt clips or drop forged fist grips or what we call a, a double saddle clamp. You have to make sure you install it properly. We, uh, the U-bolt does not go on the live end. The U-bolt goes on the dead end. They all go the same direction. They do not get alternated. And you have to use the proper number of cable clamps. With wedge sockets, make sure it's aligned properly so the bolt, the the live line comes down in line with the pin. We do not bolt or clamp the tail to the live end in any way, shape, or form. Uh, they do make special clamps that allow the live end to slide, but we don't do this uh, and crush that live end. And with that, that we're right about two minutes late uh, for the getting done. Try to keep this short and sweet, give you as much information as I can. Like I said, uh, we will try to post this on YouTube if you want to go back or have other people do it. And we'll also be doing these seminars in the future. Um, we have upcoming lift planning and also load securement the next two following Mondays. If we get really good positive feedback, we can do this again. And like I said, during the seminar, we do have a sale on nylon slings. It's buy three, get one free. So take advantage of that right now during this this whole um, epidemic or pandemic, 
so that you can get, get through, inspect them, get them replaced and get ready to go. If you do have any questions, feel free to email me, call our office, and I will stay online for a little while and let you ask me any kind of questions you want through the Q&A. Those who have to leave, I appreciate your time, and I hope you have a good day and stay safe. Thank you.